Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 158, March 25th to March 31st, 1864. Last week, we talked about the CSS Alabama, a vessel we mentioned but did not go too far in depth with. We talked about some events going on out west as well, notably Colorado and Nevada. This week, we'll check in on what's going on in Louisiana briefly. Before we do that, though, we need to talk about Nathan Bedford Forrest and his raid on Paducah, Kentucky. Of course, before we do that, let's talk a little bit about our Patreon content. And coming up, we are going to jump back into some picture slideshows. And then we will talk about some more movies, right? So uh, I know we've been movie heavy here with the Patreon content. What with the Red Badge of Courage, we had our Beguiled episodes that we posted as well. But this upcoming month of April, we will be doing some picture slideshows, and these are going to be some of the battles out here in the East that we're going to be talking about pretty quickly as we get up into May. And there's a lot that is in the area here of Virginia, the main theater of the war. So we will be showing the modern day battlefields for a couple places, and we will talk about it, of course. And that'll be a nice prep for us to get into the Overland campaign, which Hard to believe we're already pretty much there, right? And here at the end of March, and then we have April, and then we'll be jumping into that with the wilderness there first week of May. So pretty exciting stuff. We're going to have some action-packed episodes. That's going to get us in the right mindset. Talk about some movies as well. So if the Patreon feed, any of that stuff, sounds like it's something that would interest you, by all means, there is a link in the show description, and those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show, and they are greatly appreciated. So if Paducah sounds familiar, it definitely should. You might recall that Kentucky was a neutral state during the beginning of the war, but Leonidas Polk broke that neutrality by moving prematurely into the state in 1861. Ulysses S. Grant would lead a contingent to capture Paducah in one of his first actions of the war. On March 25th, it would be the target of Nathan Bedford Forrest he would lead a raid into West Tennessee and Kentucky during this time. If you recall from a previous episode, he had recently won a victory at Oklahoma and now decided not only to recruit, but also disrupt any federal activities. This is going to be a big hot ticket item for Sherman. This kind of activity is going to show that Nathan Bedford Forrest is still going to be able to disrupt operations, and if he's able to get into his supply lines as he starts to move on Atlanta, we kind of briefly mentioned the overall federal strategy here moving forward in 1864. If he's able to get into his supply lines, that could be a problem. This rating is just showing he's probably going to be capable of doing that should the Confederacy decide that's a course they want to take. So obviously, that's going to be a big problem if you're Sherman. In Kentucky, Forrest would capture the town without incident, but Colonel Stephen Hicks would withdraw his command into Fort Anderson, especially seeing as he was outnumbered. This fortification would be a tough nut to crack, and was protected by two gunboats. If you recall from other episodes, the presence of gunboats can have a great effect on the defense of a garrison. Forrest would not be deterred, and tried to bluff his way to the surrender of Hicks, who declined. In previous actions, as I'm sure you remember, there was a pretty effective strategy in Forrest requesting the surrender of a garrison. In fact, Forrest even applied there might not be any quarter should the request be declined. Now, especially as we get into the Fort Pelo incident, the Fort Pelo massacre, as some call it, that's going to be a big sticking point. Is Forrest actually saying there will be legitimately be no quarter or is that just kind of a threat that he's tacking on there using his name using the ferocity of his combat style to try to get them to surrender that's going to be the question his men would set about removing any supplies and burning the rest from the town 
They would actually return some days later to capture several horses that the newspapers boasted they had missed as they had been hidden. A relatively bloodless action was foiled when Colonel Albert Thompson, a native of Kentucky and Paducah itself, led an ill-advised charge at Fort Anderson, which included the death of Thompson himself. This would result in several casualties, the total being 50 on the side of the Confederates and 90 on the side of the Union, with most of those Union casualties actually been invalids who were captured. Despite casualties, the raid was deemed a success. We have an account from a Chicago newspaper talking about the raid, so let's go ahead and read through, including a little exaggeration at the end. Last Friday night, information reached us that Forrest had made his appearance at Paducah at 2 p.m. with 2,000 men, and had begun an attack on that city. Colonel Hicks, commander of the post, withdrew all his men, some 800, into the fort, and sent the citizens across the river to the Illinois side. The telegraph operator at Mound City said he could see a great light in the direction of Paducah, and supposed the city was in flames. General Brayman, being notified of this, sent up the 25th Wisconsin to reinforce the garrison. Saturday morning, the steamer Ioton came down, having passed Paducah at 5 o'clock, at which time the buildings occupied as headquarters, quartermasters, and commissary offices, and ammunition depot had been destroyed. Also many other houses, and the steamer Arizona, which was on the ways. The enemy appeared to have possession of the town, but the fort and three gunboats had been shelling them vigorously. When the fight began, 200 men occupied the fort and had three days' rations, but soon after, 600 other troops were thrown in, and the rations were quickly used up. Diaten was ordered to load up at Cairo with provisions and go to the relief of the garrison. Your correspondent went aboard of this steamer and proceeded to the scene of the action to ascertain what damage had been done. Before we left, however, the tycoon came down with the report that firing had ceased and the rebels had gone. In the meantime, the 4th Division, 16th Army Corps, which had been there for about a week under command of General Veach, embarked on several steamers for Paducah, hoping to catch Forrest before he could get away from them. It is said that 4,000 cavalry, sent by General Grierson from Memphis, are in the rear. An order was issued from headquarters Friday night, prohibiting the landing of steamboats on the Kentucky side of the Ohio River, between Cairo and Paducah, and the crossing of skiffs from one side of the river to the other without a permit from some military officer. We arrived at Metropolis at 7 p.m. where we found a number of women and children who had escaped from Paducah the day before. They were seated around a fire on the bank of the river, and apparently making the best of their condition. Here we were told that shelling had again commenced at 3 o'clock, but it was supposed that the gunboats were trying to drive the enemy out of the woods. At 12, it was said a flag of truce had been sent in by Forrest. Friday evening, a rebel who tried to cut the telegraph was shot dead. Captain Bachman and Captain Crutchfield of the 16th Kentucky Cavalry were wounded in the head, and Captain Bartley in the arm. Sergeant T. Hayes of the 15th Kentucky Cavalry was killed. Four white men and seven Negroes in the fort were killed. 25 houses around the fort were destroyed by the Federals because they afforded shelter for sharpshooters who could fire directly into the fortification. In Metropolis, we learned that just before the enemy came into the city, all the citizens returned to the fort and remained there until Colonel Hicks informed them that he could not furnish arms for all, and those who desired to cross the river could do so. Accordingly, many got aboard of the wharf boat, which was towed by a ferry boat to the opposite side of the river. As we approached Paducah, we saw the campfires of these people illuminating the river. Provisions were scarce among them, but Colonel Hicks had just sent over a supply, which had come from Cairo, with instructions to give to the poor, but sell to those who were able to pay. It was after dark when we landed at Paducah, but we walked up toward the fort through the smoldering ruins of the once beautiful city. The warehouses and dwellings exhibited prominent marks of the recent struggle. In many places, nothing but bare walls and chimneys were standing. Scarcely a building escaped the terrific fire of the gunboats, and many of them were completely riddled by shrapnel and solid shot. The gunboats Piasta and Papa fired in all about 500 rounds, and had two men slightly wounded. The commander of the latter vessel received a slight scratch on his cheek, and a ball passed through his pantaloons. The cabins of the boats were perforated with shot. 
It was the fire of the gunboats that did so much damage to the town. Had it not been for the Navy, Colonel Hicks would have had a much more severe contest. Upon arriving within the fort, we learned that when Forrest first came in, he formed a line of battle about two and a half miles in length, after which he sent a flag of truce to Colonel Hicks, stating that he had enough men to storm and capture the fort, but desiring to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, he demanded a surrender, promising to treat his captives as prisoners of war, and threatening, in case of refusal, to give no quarter. Colonel Hicks replied that he had been placed there to defend the fort, and he was obliged to obey orders, and could not, as an honest soldier, comply with the demand. So a couple things to unpack here. We're not quite done with the account from the newspaper here, but a couple things to unpack. The first is this request of Forrest to surrender the garrison. And part of the problem is, and part of the key part where he says, we're going to treat everyone as a prisoner of war, is that there were some United States colored troops that were in the fort, right? So there's always this specter, shall we say, that if we surrender, we're all going to, at the very least, right, be forced back into slavery, but then we are also, but then we also could just be executed, right? So nobody wants that. And if the option is, well, you fight it out and have a pretty good opportunity to defend the fort or surrender and kind of take your chances with those two options, you obviously you're going to want to fight it out. At least I definitely would. And the other thing I want to take away from here is that the destruction that the gunboats are kind of laying on the town here uh, obviously, we're going to get into the actual attack itself and a, a small account of that, but we mentioned how gunboats are pretty important to defending these river towns, these river fortifications, and obviously, even not seeing it firsthand, you can kind of see the destruction of it, and it's painted pretty well in this account, how there's all these dwellings that have been destroyed and, and things like that, so if you are attacking a fortification, you're having to deal with these heavier guns that are really laying waste to a town or a countryside, then obviously that's going to be a game changer if you're in the fort, even if you have less men. So very nice illustration of that. While this parlay was going on, Forrest advanced his sharpshooters and placed them in houses where they could pick off men in the fort and the gunboats. The battle soon began and for several hours raged with fury. The gunboats poured their broadsides into the city, demolishing buildings and killing and wounding many of the enemy. The guns from the fort thundered forth into the rebel ranks, and as the Confederates rushed their breastworks, mowed them down like grass. Forrest put his best regiments in front, and notwithstanding, they exhibited great courage, some of the men marching up to the very mouths of the guns. They were repulsed four or five times. Their commanding general said they had never faltered before. There were about 800 men within the fortifications, but only about one-third actively participated in the fight. Colonel Hicks calmly directed all the operations and showed such bravery and skill as to title him to great praise. Around the fort lay heaps of unburied rebels and the blackened remains of many of the beautiful dwellings. While the battle was raging, parties of the enemy scattered through the city, plundering stores and robbing stables. A large amount of goods were carried away and many horses were stolen none of the latter belonging to the government, were taken, as the rebels were told this was property of a prominent secessionist. The fight lasted all the afternoon and resulted in a federal loss of, as stated below, about 30 prisoners. These, with the 400 taken a day or two before at Union City, Forrest offered to exchange for Confederate prisoners man for man, but Colonel Hicks replied that he was not authorized to make any such arrangement. The number of white Federals killed is 14, wounded, 46, 11 Negroes were killed and wounded, all shot in the head. The rebels had 300 killed and about 1,000 wounded. The latter they took to Mayfield by railroad. The former they left unburied. Among the Confederate officers slain was Brigadier General A.P. Thompson, a former resident of Paducah. The enemy remained about the city until 3 p.m. on Saturday when they moved off in the direction of Columbus, where fit was supposed next fight would take place. Learning that the place was threatened, your correspondent hurried aboard, of the dispatch vote volunteer and returned to Cairo this morning. So we have some things to unpack here in this account. Obviously there's some exaggeration and part of the numbers and that's fairly usual. We've highlighted that before, how you're going to kind of exaggerate, make things sound bigger than they were, you know, 300 killed and a thousand wounded. 
probably not the case, right? But still a pretty concise account, and there's certain things we can take away from here if we take the numbers with a grain of salt. The main point we really should take away, though, is that Paducah has been defended. Forrest is going to feel some type of way about not being able to capture the garrison, and despite there being some other successes that we will get into as we're right around the corner from Fort Pillow, speaking of that, this setback, shall we say, at Paducah is definitely going to sit in on the minds of not only his men, but Forrest himself, and that is going to be mixed in with a lot of other factors that we're going to talk about that's going to result in what happens at Fort Pillow. So stay tuned for that. So we have touched on music in the Civil War, but I think it's high time to go a little bit more in depth. Now we have already seen in some of the movies we have reviewed or in some of the memoirs that music was popular prior to the outbreak of the war. Playing music was a fun activity you might do with friends or family, a way to pass the time. So it would have been a strong tie to the home and reminders of family that still waited for the soldiers to return. It's hard to imagine that a family would gather around a piano for fun in the modern age. And to be fair, maybe a family that still does that, but with TVs and other devices for entertainment. But I'm not so sure many kids are going to want to gather around and play the Battle Hymn of the Republic. But again, you would be able to pass the time in a life where you probably did not have too many options for entertainment. Much like economics, I will admit musical history is not really a strong suit of mine, so you might have to bear with me as I get through some of these points. Unfortunately, for some, maybe sounding like nails on a chalkboard. The period leading up to the Civil War would be known as the Romantic Period of Music, which is classified by more instruments making more expressions, so larger bands or orchestras, although the average person in America before the war would probably not have been able to hear an orchestra. Of this era, we have composers such as Tchaikovsky, Brahms, Verdi, and Wagner, so fairly big names. I have at least heard of them. You probably still would have older composers, and they would have been popular, such as Mozart and Beethoven, in the 1800s, so you would probably hear them too. The Great Awakening, which you should remember from the first couple of episodes, is also a big event that would go toward music and the spread of different styles. Music can be associated with religious connotations, so different hymns would be used to various services, and if you look at the popular music of the era, you will notice a lot of them are in fact stemming from churches. It should be noted that music was influenced by the enslaved. These individuals have their own style, which included dancing and more emphasis on drums. So this would also be added. Additionally, there would be several popular songs that were made to support emancipation. The Civil War is going to be a key event going toward the expansion of music. There were 54,000 musicians estimated as serving during the conflict, and several thousand songs were composed. We already mentioned taps as being what such song penned during the conflict. Remember too, Maryland My Maryland, which we talked about way back in our early episodes, as also coming into being. With the armies traveling through the countryside, there would be a spread of the different music, so it would be interwoven into the culture. Soldiers would play music in camp, during a siege, while marching, and even in some cases as a morale boost during combat. Remember that we had at the Battle of Williamsburg, Samuel Heinzelman wishing for the bands to play music to rally the breaking Federals. There are a lot of tunes that I think you would find familiar. You already had such tunes like Dixie, which is still revered as a kind of anthem for the South. When Johnny Comes Marching Home, Battle Cry Freedom, Eating Goober Peas, The Bonnie Blue Flag, and even the intro and outro music to this podcast, A Menstrual Boy, were other popular songs. If you remember Benjamin Butler, he would have a heavier-handed tactic when occupying the crescent city of New Orleans. He would actually destroy printed copies of the Bonnie Blue Flag and threaten to punish anyone, including children, who were heard singing the tune. 
Famously as well, before the Battle of Stones River, bands on both sides, north and south, would duel each other, so to speak, before finally playing Home Sweet Home together. There would be an uptick in the production or import of brass instruments during this period, which obviously also has an impact on music in America moving forward. Soldiers in camp would turn to fiddles and banjos as part of their entertainment, if brass was not readily available, especially in the South. Southern production of sheet music would also increase during the war, which might seem surprising given the lesser production capability of the Confederacy. Just to kind of backtrack a little bit, we did mention how Stones River, they did have a kind of duel between the bands playing songs back and forth. That's not really the only time that they did that. In fact, there's a lot of accounts where you have this kind of, shall we say, Christmas true style, like we're going to play music back and forth, so to speak, sing songs, right? You think of that more when you think about World War One and that famous uh, truce of 1914, where there is some mingling between the lines and we're going to sing songs together. And that's a great kind of uh, point for humanity, shall we say, that even during a most terrible war, we're able to do that. Well, there is some of that in the Civil War. And as especially as we get into 1864 and talk more about the modern war style and we get into what's probably more reminiscent of trench warfare than, shall we say, the Napoleonic Wars. So that's kind of talked about that before. The Civil War is kind of a mix between the two. But there are these instances where the two sides are going to either mingle or come together or play songs. And there's a lot of memoirs that we see out there, even in some of the letters that I believe we've read in this podcast as part of the main narrative feed, that the soldiers are going to think that that's memorable enough to write it down and it's kind of this across the board kind of deal where i've seen it in multiple different sources where people write about this so obviously music is not only a way to pass the time it's also pretty important into their lives and it's important enough where they're sharing this common ground or this common culture over music so i think it is interesting to see that written down in these memoirs so i just kind of wanted to point that out and especially in a situation prior to Stones River, where the very next day, there's going to be a, a pretty substantial battle. We mentioned how that's going to be the uh, highest casualty by percentage battle of the war for those engaged. So obviously, the night prior to that kind of jumping off, it is sort of heartwarming in a way that they're finding this common ground. You get more of this is the common soldiers fight versus the politicians and the generals fighting it. You get sort of themes of that as well, where they sort of know what's going to happen and they need this music to either wind down, calm nerves, what have you, focus on something else, right? And I think we all have had that before where maybe we have an outlet that would help us in a sporting situation or, or a stressful situation, right? And certainly music is probably right up there with the Civil War soldier, right? So we can find a find this common ground between the modern day and what we go through and what we experience with these individuals from the past. And I think that's also very important because these are people and they go through real experiences. They're real. And it is always very nice to have those threads that connect us in the modern day to the past as well. Music did serve a practical purpose. Bugles, of course, were used to give commands on a crowded and noisy battlefield. Remember that weapons were not quite smokeless yet, so it was important to have some way in which you could get your point across and give commands. Especially over the large amount of noise of the battlefield, so it had to be particularly loud. August Villick would have special bugle calls for his men, which also signaled his famous fire and advance technique. Drums were also important to the battlefield. There are several different marching cadences that you would need to know so as to keep the troops on pace. Commonly, besides bugles, you would also see fife and drum bands for this purpose. Robert E. Lee would say that they could not have an army without music, which for practical and entertainment purposes is important, as I believe we have highlighted. So we can stop there for now. This week, we had some lighter fare. We had Nathan Bedford Forrest raiding Paducah, Kentucky. He's going to continue operating this region 
and we will cover soon his more infamous action. We also talked about music during the war a little more in depth. It would be a pretty important part of the culture. Next week, we will spend time in Arkansas talking about Steele's actions supporting the Red River campaign. And don't think I did not catch the fact that we talked about how we would mention Louisiana and, of course, the Red River campaign. When I first envisioned this episode, I believe I thought we would talk about Louisiana in this episode, but I figured also it might be easier if we put the entirety of the Camden expedition in an episode and then the majority of the Red River campaign in another episode so we can put those side by side and really see what's going on. So rest assured, we will get back to the Pelican State soon enough. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.